The Power Moms Network, empowering moms to lift the world. Welcome. I'm Riley Karsh. I'm Tova Copan. We are thrilled to bring you the We Go Boldly podcast. Let's talk big burning questions, life changes, and maybe a bit of personal business. Let's be bold and brave together. Are you ready? I am. Here comes the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to We Go Boldly, the podcast where we are thrilled to be a part of the Power Moms Network. At Power Moms Network, we are empowering moms and creating a community of mothers mentoring other moms to greatness. If you are a mom, if you like moms, if you know moms, uh, you should join this community. It's very cool. It's a great place to be. And uh, we certainly encourage you to check it out when you have time. It is season 11 and it is interview day. And I am like beyond excited about this interview today. So um, I am going to just say hello to Tova. Welcome her to the show. Not just, I'm going to say hello to Tova and welcome her to the show. And uh, and then we're going to talk to a guest that I'm super, if you can't tell, super excited about it. I think it's going to be great. I'm like the Energizer Bunny. Um, hi, yeah. hi, this is, yeah, I'm like thrown off by your energy. I'm I like, know. I don't, I don't know what it's, what's happening. Who I, knows? I mean, I'm on so many like medications at the moment for I all know. the illnesses. Like who knows what's happening? I'm glad there. you mentioned that. Cause I was like, do I mention the steroids and how excited you are? And I think I know, right? the steroids like, or do don't I worry. like, soon I'll get angry. It'll be fine. <laughs> steroid rage. Right. Um, yeah, no. Uh, did you ask me a question? Yeah. Um, how are you? What's happening? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Um, I don't know. It's, you know, I don't know. It's, cool. it's a blur. There's been so many back-to-back calls today yeah. and I don't even know, like, I don't remember anything. It's a blur, but I think I'm good. I think I'm on the home stretch, which feels exciting. And I don't, love days like this in the sense, like I start losing the ability to like be in the place that I am. Yes. Um, I used to love days like this. And I think it was because I lost the ability to be in the place that I am. <laughs> yeah. Isn't and, that funny how that shifts once you like start, you know, being a little more self-aware and, and whatnot. Yeah, and also because you like the place where you are and you're yeah. like, no, I want to be here. Um, and so I think think having this person, um, on our call, um, is extra exciting. And I realized that we're doing something that's funny. So, um, and I, and I promise I'll introduce the person momentarily, but I listened to two podcasts where the guest is like a mystery to the people on the show. Like, it's not really a mystery on the show, but they act like it's a mystery. And, um, and yet everybody knows who it is who's listening to the podcast because they you write the name of the person in the episode right, title. Right, right. It's very right? clear who it is. Yeah. yeah. And so like I listen to the handsome podcast and I'm like, yeah, we're really excited to have this person. And and they like act like nobody knows who the person is, even though we all know who the person is because it's in the name of the show. And sure. the same with smart list, like they're super secretive. And on that show, they're secret with each other. But once again, like we all know who it is because- it's in the name of the show. So yeah. once again, this person's name will be in the show notes or in the name of the show. And yet I'm acting all secretive, but we do anyway. it every time. It's fine. Um, yeah, it's a podcast thing. Yeah, it's fine. I like it. So we're talking about, not ironically, we're talking about energy today. Specifically, we're talking about energy healing, cranial sacral therapy, and different kind of modalities is, is the like jargon word. Um, of ways that you can sort of use these tools to help you create the life you want to be living by, as we've talked about all season long, letting go of things that have you stuck, you know, behaviors, uh, mindsets, um, the trauma that's happened in your life. Uh, even, even if you don't think it's trauma, like bad stuff happens and it gets stuck and it, you hold it in your body. Good stuff happens and you get stuck and you hold it in your body. So um, I'm very, very excited to learn more about cranial sacral therapy specifically. Um, I, as you all probably remember, I've done Reiki training and I love it. I think it's fascinating. Tova and I have both done 
uh, worked with other Reiki practitioners and it's like bonkers what they can do. Um, and so I'm thrilled to have this, uh, this guest on today and I'm going to stop talking and let you take over and do the intro Tova. Okay. So I'm going to do the intro and I will say, um, I am so excited to have this guest because this uh, guest is, is my, uh, cranial sacral therapist. And I found her, um, actually I have no idea how I found her. Oh no, no. I do know how I found her. Um, I think, um, but anyway, I was having Reiki done and my Reiki healer, I suddenly forgot what you would call someone who did Reiki was like, I think you would benefit from cranial sacral therapy. And I was like, cool. What's that? So, um, I ended up finding someone in my area who does this. And that is, um, the lovely Amanda who is joining us today. So Amanda is the owner of find relief therapy, which is a private occupational therapy practice located in East Hanover, New Jersey. She treats infants, children, and adults with a variety of developmental and chronic pain conditions using her extensive training and clinical experience in cranial sacral therapy and root FX. Maybe that's how you would say that. I'm not sure. She is New Jersey's only OT with this skill set. Amanda received her master's of science in occupational therapy from the university of Scranton in 2002 and has built a diverse OT career of mental health and pediatrics and physical disabilities work experience. As an OT, Amanda believes in working one-on-one with each client to help them relieve their pain, retrain their body and restore their functioning in life. She is passionate that the unique therapy she provides gives each client the knowledge and support to help them engage in their own healing and make permanent changes in their bodies functioning. Uh, so with that, all that being said, welcome, Amanda. We are so excited that you are here joining us. How are you today? I am very good. I am very excited also <laughs> to be here. <laughs> um, yeah. So we love to just dive right into like super deep questions. Um, yeah. Hopefully that's okay for you. Yeah. Um, as you know, all season 11, we're, it's the unbecoming season. Um, and so we ask everyone if you had a superpower to kind of undo or let go of, or, um, get rid of one thing you learned that really wasn't very good for you or that you wish, you know, maybe you didn't learn, um, in the past, what would it be like, and and why, why would you want that to be the thing that didn't, didn't impact your life. Oh, wow. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that I would want to unlearn would be that my worth is not connected to anyone else's actions, whatever anyone else thinks about me, however, how they react to me, that none of that has anything to do with my own worth um, yeah. and my own worthiness of love. I think if I, I, if I could just get that one and I mean, that's what I've been working on in my own personal life. Yeah. Um, that's a big one. It's it kind of encompasses huge. everything. Yeah. Um, and it's, it really kind of gets to the core of, of um, being able to really, truly feel love for like myself, for my body, for my space here in the world. So yeah, that would be it. Um, <laughs> so how, uh, how I think we all kind of relate to that and- so and like how far back, if you look back in your life, do you see yourself influenced by those, um, that, that feeling or that, like how maybe, I, I don't know if it's like, how can you feel that feeling? Or maybe do you see decisions being sort of influenced by that, that drive of that desire for worthiness that outside influence is having? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it, it kind of encompasses a lot of different, like from, for me personally, like I could go back to, you know, when I was a younger child, um, seven, eight, nine, like when your ego is developing, uh, psychologically, um, I'm, you know, when I was starting to become more aware of, of my world and the people around me and perceiving what, what they're doing, um, you know, I can think of things, sometimes traumas in my life when, you know, I sort of absorbed someone else's energy or someone else's, you know, issues in reaction to me. Um, but then, you know, sometimes I can go back to when I was an infant because 
infants, babies in the womb, we're when when we're here, we're always perceiving the outside world, whether we understand it or not. So, you know, I'm always talking when I work with infants um, and their moms, you know, I always talk to them about what the pregnancy was like. You know, if if a if a mom is going through a stressful time at work while she's pregnant, the baby doesn't necessarily know. It knows that mom is stressed. It can feel that mom is stressed, but it doesn't know why mom is stressed. And so sometimes the baby can say, oh, well, mom seems really stressed all the time. Maybe I I, I should probably try and match that because I'm, I'm growing and matching everything that, you know, developmentally is happening. So maybe I should match that stress. Baby doesn't know it has nothing to do with them. Um, you know, and I mean, I don't know how far you want to go back, but you can look at generational. <laughs> um things, you know, me as a woman, um, you know, how am I perceived in the world as a woman and how, how do I define my own worth as that and that of my mother and my grandmother and, you know, generations of women back. So I kind of look at, you can look at it at a, a lot of different points in, in, you know, a life cycle. Yeah. I think that that's a, a really important point and something I, I'm hoping you'll touch on at some point, the, the concept of generational trauma and whether it's, generational trauma in the like what I would call capital T trauma kind of way or generational trauma in the sense that like culturally we're not kind to women and that's been the case for ever and so that passes down and hopefully improves over time but it's still there like we're still we all still carry that to some extent um and I think you know what I would like to understand I guess from your perspective what in your life allowed you the the space to recognize that this was a, I don't want to call it a mistaken belief. I, we, we've struggled to find another way to describe it, but like something that got embedded in you that shouldn't have been right. And when did you realize that? And how did you start to make, you know, and I'm sure you're still working on it like we are, but how did you start to make changes to sort of let go of that, that way of thinking? Um, I was lucky enough to, uh, in my twenties, my early twenties, um, you know, I just sort of started on my career, um, and, uh, I was living on my own and, you know, going to be getting married, um, soon. And I was lucky enough to, um, my, the, the place where I was working had like mental health services. And one of the therapists there that was like free for employees. And one of the therapists there, um, she, uh, I started seeing her, um, just cause I, I kind of, you know, I just got the sense that something wasn't right. And I was starting to become sort of more empowered as an adult. And, um, I started working with her and, um, she started introducing myself, uh, me to these concepts. And, um, I read the book, um, the four agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, um, which is one of my personal, uh, <laughs> life books. And, um, you know, I've been pulling at that thread ever since. Yeah. Um, and when I, when I saw the changes that it could make both in my personal relationships, in the health of my body, um, you know, once you kind of get a taste of that and you realize like, oh, I don't have to be a victim. I have the ability to, to change things that I want to change. Um, that has made you know, that made a huge difference. And I just wanted more and more. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, that's how I kind of, um, came upon it, but, um, and I feel very lucky that I came upon that earlier in my life so that I've had now, I think it's like 22 or 23 years of, of exploring that and working with myself and, you know, I don't know. It's made me what I am today. So yeah, I want to highlight that though, for people listening, you just said you've been working on this for like 22, 23 years, and we'll probably continue to work on it for the rest of your life, like myself and Tova. Um, And so if you're out there listening and you're like, oh, I am really like in this place, but I'm 40 and what am I going to do about it? Right. It's just it's one little step at a time, right? It's one little change at a time. It's one book. It's one conversation with a therapist, a friend, whatever. So, you know, there, you're never, it's never too late to start the process. And it's not something that's going to be like checked in off a box tomorrow, right? Like it's a, it's a lifelong process of letting go of these kinds of um, limiting beliefs or uh, mistaken beliefs, whatever we want to call them. So 
um, I just appreciate you sharing that and, and letting people in on that, like not so secret secret about <laughs> the whole process and how hard it can be. Yeah. Um, Tova, did you have a question? I think I interrupted well, you. Well, I have a lot of questions Same. about how you decided to become a, you know, a cranial sacral therapist or an energy healer and all of that. But first, I think it's really important for you to tell people what cranial sacral therapy is, because I find it to be totally fascinating. And um, I will be like the first to get in line to be like, I don't totally understand how it works, but I know that it totally works. I've had it work on myself in, you know, a variety of like, ailments, both like, Hey, I'm going to show up and be like, Hey, this hurts. And then you're, I leave and it doesn't hurt anymore, but also like I'm preparing for surgery. And then I get on the other side of surgery and I think I've healed faster. And also like, um, I've had a, you know, you've worked with my son with his migraine. I mean, just like, and just a variety of things. So I'm like, I don't know why it works. I don't know really what it is, but it works. So before we get into, how you got there and what it does and what it is, uh, or all of this great stuff. I would love for, if you just explain to people what craniosacral therapy is. Sure. Um, craniosacral therapy is a gentle touch therapy that, um, uses the craniosacral system. So everyone in their body has fluid that encases the brain and spine. It's called the cerebrospinal fluid. And that fluid flows, it physically moves, like you can see it on imaging, it flows through this sort of closed loop system. And it nourishes the brain tissue, the brain stem, it pulls out impurities, it cushions. Um, it's a very important um, uh, structure, part of the, the uh, brain and spine. And the nervous system, the central nervous system, all the nerves that go out from your spinal cord to the whole rest of your body, are, is encased in that fluid. And with craniosacral therapy, I, with my hands, similar to how you would take a pulse reading or how you would, um, you know, measure someone's breath rate. I can feel the flow of that fluid with my hands. Uh, it's kind of like, um, tuning, uh, like changing the station on a radio. I can just, I've trained my, like I, I've learned how to, to listen for that the flow of that fluid. And that can tell, um, tell me based on the qualities of the flow of the fluid, what's going on at, in a particular area of the body. Um, this work was, uh, the work that I studied, it was created by Dr. John Upledger. Um, and I've studied exclusively through the Upledger Institute, which is an international institute that teaches craniosacral therapy and many other of these types of modalities. And, um, yeah, I've been studying it since 2009 and I love it and I use it every day. And um, yeah, it's it's just, I'm constantly wanting to learn more. I'm constantly being amazed by the things that my clients experience and the ways that they release and heal. Um, yeah, it's really magical. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that because I would love for you to sort of explain to folks listening um, not only like why you decided this was the modality that made sense to you, but how, like, what kinds of things do your clients come in for help with and how, like, what does that look like? What is that process? Sure. Um, for craniosacral therapy, I mean, I connected with it. I was introduced to it by, um, another classmate who was running a pediatric practice and um, she did craniosacral therapy and she introduced me to it. I saw her doing it and I thought, oh, I'll take a class um, in, you know, as in most states, you have to take educational classes to keep your uh, licensure and certification up. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I'll take a class. And um, I took the first like level one training and I don't know, it just spoke to me. And, you know, thankfully, because I had been working on myself and because I was learning to listen to my own intuition and my own guidance, you know, I listened to that little voice that said like, Hey, pay attention. This is, this is something, you know, this you can, I connected to it just like I connected to the four agreements when I read that book. And it was like, I was reading it and it was like, I've heard this information before. I know this, or I, I can, I could connect to this. 
It was the same thing when I was learning craniosacral therapy. Um, and so, you know, the clients who come to my practice, um, I have a, I, I call it a family practice. So I, I work with the whole, um, generations, all <laughs> infants, children, and adults, which makes marketing really fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, like it narrow down your marketing focus. Well, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Um, but I do that because the whole family needs to be healthy. Yeah. Clients who come in that bring their children, their I mean their infants, um, are it's usually, you know, they're having feeding issues, um, babies with torticollis or which is like tight muscles of the neck. Um, maybe they're having some developmental delays, not rolling, um, you know, not uh not developing correctly. Um, but then, you know, I look at the mom and if mom has really tight shoulders or dad has, you know, constant migraines, you know, they end up also getting treatment because the whole family needs to be, um, well. So most people who come to my practice have tried a lot of different things or have sort of tried more of the traditional, um, medical, you know, things they've gotten all the tests they've tried some medications, you know, they've gone to this specialist, that specialist, and, you know, some of that helps. Um, but they're really looking for answers. Either they've been told there's nothing wrong. That's a, that's a very, very common one, which really just means we don't know. Um, it's a, it's a polite way of saying we don't know. And they're looking for answers. They're looking for, you know, why this you know, chronic migraines are happening or why do they have tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears or why, you know, are they in chronic pain? Um, and so, you know, they come to, they come sort of looking for the underlying causes and that's what craniosacral therapy can get to. It can really get down to like a very cellular level of, you know, figuring out what's going on. So. Uh, we need to take a break. Cause I don't think we have yet. No, we I... haven't yet. Okay. Um, then let's take a quick break and we will be, uh, right back. Well, Hey there, dream chaser. Are you ready to make the next 12 months of your life? Unforgettable. Introducing the year of you, a groundbreaking new goal system group. That's about to redefine the way we approach personal growth. Join us with a community of like-minded individuals committed to unlocking their full potential with expert guidance, personalized strategies, kind-hearted accountability, and a supportive network. The Year of You is more than just a goal-setting group. It's a whole movement. Don't just dream about it, achieve it. Click in the link in our show notes, or go ahead and visit us at goboldlyinitiative.com backslash year of you to learn more today. Let's embark on a transformative journey together towards becoming the best versions we can be. The year of you, where your goals become reality. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so I I know I I have like loads of follow-up questions that are mostly just about like my own personal cranial sacral um, therapy. <laughs> Cause I'm like, oh, remember the time? Remember the time that you did this? Remember the time that you did that? But um what I find to be interesting and I about cranial sacral therapy, and and I would, you know, be interested in you talking about this. And you talked about this a little bit about how like you can get to some of the underlying, you know causes or, you know, root causes, but, you know, a lot of what we're talking about this season is how the body, um, carries, you know, carries trauma or can carry a lot of the emotional pain. And then it comes out as pain, um, in other ways. And how, how have you seen that, um, when you are treating someone or, um, I'll use my body as an example. When you, when I have come in and, um, you know, I think at one point you went to treat one part of my body, even though something else was hurting and you're like, no, but we're going to focus on this thing. And then it was like, oh no, we're not because it's not letting me, 
I don't know if it was, it wasn't letting you focus on my head until you dealt with my stomach. Like something was like, my body was sort of like directing you. And so I'm just wondering, you know, um, how have you, I guess, how does the body guide you? Maybe is the question that I have when you're working on the body. Um, how does the body kind of tell you, um, what's going on? Sure. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways, uh, to communicate with the body and, um, as a therapist, um, or as a craniosacral therapist, when I'm working, I'm doing it correctly. If I'm as neutral as possible, neutral, meaning that I don't come in with my own agenda. Like I don't come in like, I'm going to fix this and I know what's right. And she says her knees hurt. So we're going to work on her knees. No, I, I come in completely neutral. Um, when I start a session, I usually start at someone's feet because it's a very grounding place to work, a very neutral place to start. And I just like connect with the craniosacral rhythm. And I actually wait to feel the craniosacral rhythm. I do not go in and say, I'm going to feel the craniosacral rhythm. I just put my hands on their body and wait for the craniosacral rhythm to come to me and to show itself. And that's sort of the body inviting me in. And I just say, Hey, I'm here. I'm here to listen. I'm here to do whatever you need me to do. And the body will, we call it in craniosacral therapy, the inner physician, the inner physician, the inner intuition that, that the body's knowing, um, will come to me in a variety of ways. Sometimes I will sort of see a plan um, like kind of visually in my mind in, when I look at the alignment of the person's body, sometimes I'll kind of hear a plan. <laughs> sometimes, um, there's a, a technique called the significance detector, which I'll use, which is like yes and no. And it kind of, I'm able to, the body will turn the rhythm of the craniosacral rhythm on and off in response to questions. Um, there's a lot of different ways to communicate, but, um, I just follow along. I do as I'm told, because if I don't do as I'm told, the body will not respond well. So like, you know, and it's a balance because if someone comes in for migraines or for a headache, you know, I don't want to like not work on their head at all. I need to explain to them, oh, well, we need to release your shoulder first or your, you know, pelvic diaphragm first um, before, before we get to your head or I am given a specific order of what needs to, to happen first, second, and third. So I, you know, I, I, tr I really just try and listen. Um, and I also, but even more than that, like that's my role, but the client also has a role because they, you know, I can work with their body and that's really great. And, and a lot of people like that, but because I'm an occupational therapist and it's all about function and independence and someone being able to function in their own lives, what I what I think benefits the client the most is having them learn to listen to their body and them reestablishing that connection with their body, especially you know clients with chronic pain or a chronic condition or something that they've been dealing with for so many years or something that they don't know what's going on it can be be very disempowering they can sort of shut down or or disconnect from their bodies just out of sheer preservation and but what's unfortunately what's lost is that line of communication that their body is trying to talk to them their body is trying to tell them hey over here over here look at this this is a i need your help here um so really trying to help my clients get them to, to connect back into their bodies and listen to their body's intuition and what it, why is this happening? Why is this pain? You know, why are they experiencing this symptom? Um, that's, I think, even more important than, you know, me connecting in with their bodies and helping them. Yeah, so. I think um, we were just talking about this with someone, the, the mind-body connection is um, obviously a huge factor in everything we're talking about and, and everything you do. Um, what do you, I don't know how to ask this question appropriately. Um, how do folks come to you and like, and not, do they not have that understanding? Do you have to teach that? Like, 
what does that look like? Is it, is it a lot of people coming to you and being like, I feel physically ill and I don't know why. Um, and not have any idea that like they have something to do with that or like maybe something in their past has something to do with it. Or do most people seem like kind of in tune with that, that concept? Um, I I really get the whole line. Like I get people who call me up and they say, I have trauma from, you know, from, you know, some very, you know, some real trauma and it's stuck in my body and I need you to come and help me work. I need to come in and help, have you help me work with it? Great. Um, and then I have people who come in and say, you know, I've had migraines for, you know, most of my life and I have no idea why. And they have no, and you ask, you know, well, you know, what, how, how's your, you know, emotional, they, nothing like they're not, no, like there's no acknowledgement or no connection with them and then everything in between. Um, but, you know, going back to what we were talking about before in terms of those beliefs that you get and you accumulate over the years, you know, one of them very commonly is that is this sort of disconnection with their body or believing that they don't have any say in what, in the healing of their body, um, yeah. you know, going, I, I mean, well, in some ways we don't, I mean, if you get a paper cut, you don't have to be like, okay, let's go body. <laughs> you're going to heal this paper cut. And this is what you're going to do. No, the body just does it. It knows how to heal a paper cut. No, yeah. I mean, you could cheer it on. Like, it. There's- you put a bandaid <laughs> on it. Fine. You do those things to like support it. Right, right, Like right. you don't have to be like, okay, let's heal this paper cut. <laughs> but it's like, I got this. So, you know, why is that? Why would be, you know, healing from some other, you know, seemingly larger issue any different? Um, but, you know, you learn when you're a child, of course, your parents help you when you're sick. Um, you know, people go to doctors for advice. They go to other, they sort of seek, we learn, I think in our, in our culture and our society to seek outside answers. And those can be very helpful. And if your inner intuition is, Hey, I think I need to, I think this might be helpful for me. That's a good way of connecting into what you need and finding the answers for yourself. But if you come at it from a, like, I am powerless. I don't know what to do. You please help me. That can kind of, that is a mindset that can disconnect people from, from their own healing. From the, yeah, absolutely. What do you think for you? It's, it's somebody comes to you and they're like one of those folks who's really disconnected. What's the first step in helping them sort of figure out, like kind of pushing them along the path to Hey, my mind, my body, my lived experience, all of it is interconnected. Um, sometimes I, I, you know, obviously depends on the person and will a lot of times will dialogue during, um, a session. Mm. Sometimes it's just having them become aware of the verbiage that they're using, the words that they're using, um, in, in a very gentle and, and easy way. Like, you know, well, this is my bad shoulder. And, um, you know, oh, like I've got a bad back, just that word bad. Like, yeah. is it bad? Is it a bad shoulder? <laughs> is it evil? Has it done something wrong? <laughs> I mean, I might I mean, say that about my knees. I'm going to be honest with you. They okay. might be demon right. knees. <laughs> and, and, you know, but, but it, it, what it using that word bad really, I, I can help. I sort of use that as a way to show them their feelings about their shoulder yeah. About like, you know, why are you calling it bad? Oh, I don't know. Why am I calling it bad? Is it bad? Well, it's not really bad, but the pain is bad and the pain bothers me. And you just kind of get them talking yeah, um, yep. and get them realizing, um, you know, or a lot of times I'll ask my clients, like, you know, on a scale of one to 10, we, you know, I'm always doing pain scales because, you know, yes, this is, I get into emotions and whatever, but it's very, all the work is very based in like anatomy and structure. And, you know, we look for functional goals. So it's, it's very grounded in that way. So, you know, I'll have clients measure their pain or the reading their symptoms. And then sometimes I'll be like, okay, so this is how much, you know, pain you're having. How much on a scale of one to 10, would you say you love your, your body and you're grateful for it? Silence, (laughs) you know, usually like, huh? Okay. That's a one, you know, on the uh, one out of 10. 
So just kind of, you know, I just kind of like lay that groundwork a little bit and they'll go, huh? Yeah. I've never thought about how much I love my body. I only really think about how much pain my body is in or how much I'm sad or angry or, you know, so I kind of bring them along and then we yeah. open up dialogue that way. So how does your approach differ with kids? Um, not infants. I mean, with infants, I imagine you are speaking to them as you're doing things with them, but, um, with they're kids, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're not speaking back. <laughs> yeah. Um, but with kids, so they're maybe potentially more open to hearing things, um, because they have less, you know, adult rules that they're living by. Um, what are, and, and I will speak, you know, I, I don't think my son would be too upset about me sharing, uh, you know, when he, m- my son is not a huge fan of therapy and does not really like to share things with people who he hasn't, you know, vetted and known for 18 years, he's been alive for 12. So that makes him talking <laughs> to people difficult. And he came to see you for his migraines. And I think the fact that it was like, no, this person's going to help with some anxiety and migraines and you don't have to talk to her just allowed him to be like, okay, cool. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, he just like, just, I've never heard him speak to, um, somebody so much. Um, but how do you talk to kids about how they speak to their bodies or about their bodies or do you when you're helping them? Um, I, I don't really as much. I mean, it depends. I mean, a child who's maybe like, I don't know, 11, 10, 11, 12 and older, I certainly can. Um, but it, you know, younger kids, of course, they're, they're really no nonsense. <clears throat> they will be very clear about what I can and cannot do. Um, um, you know, they'll try every trick in the book if they, you know, are avoiding something or protecting something that needs to be, um, released. Um, a lot of times it's actually talking with the parents, um, because children are feeding off of their parents' energy. Um, so, so I always involve the parents and how they view things and how they, um, uh, are viewing what's going on. You know, when a parent brings a child for a specific issue, the parents would understandably very focused on that one issue. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll address it, but I also try and have them look at all the things that the child is developmentally doing well. Um, because I think that, that kind of softens it sometimes. Um, uh, and, uh, the kid doesn't really care. (laughs) They just know that I feel better when I go there and I get to play with toys and she makes my body feel better. So, you know, they don't have as much like, um, they don't have as much layers as adults do. Um, they usually heal much quicker. Um, I can access things quicker. Um, and, uh, and if they don't want me to touch a certain area, they will literally like bat me away or like <laughs> move around. Um, and, you know, and I'll ask a child, like, do you need a break? Yeah, I need a break. Or, um, you know, I just, um, I, I have a lot of respect for infants and children. And I, I just, they're very open, sweet little souls. Or, you know, sometimes I will, and I have a lot of children on the spectrum um, who are nonverbal. But, you know, I'll ask them, you know, where do you want me to work? Can you point to where you want me to work today? Or is there any part of your body that needs help? So my older kids who are nonverbal and they will, they'll just like, it'll be a quick tap or they'll go, you know, and I'll just, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll, yeah. I'll talk to them like that. But um, they don't, kids don't have as nearly as much, um, they have trauma for sure. Um, I was just talking to a, a mom the other day whose um, son has had a lot of um, needle sticks in his life. Um, and his body is really kind of accumulating some trauma uh, related to having to have uh, blood drawn and, and, and um, IVs all the time and how that is physically that, that trauma of constantly being stuck. And when he was, he was in the NICU. So he was constantly stuck in the heel as a, as an infant. So he, his body has developed a lot of that trauma. Now he has not expressed that to me himself, 
but you know, the mom was, is aware that that's something that's been building and we're, we're working on that with him. So, um, yeah. I think, um, we need to take another quick break. Uh, but when we come back, I want to talk, dive more into what you were just talking about in the, in the body, like in these things building in the body and like, what does that, what does that look like to somebody who's not us, who hasn't had these conversations at length, right? What does that look like to the average person on the street? Like, how do you even begin to realize that that's what's happening? So um, we're going to take a quick break and we will be right back, everyone. Hey there, pod family. Have you ever wished you could stay in the loop with a little slice of transformation and inspiration delivered straight to your inbox? Well, you're in luck because now you can. Introducing our fantastic newsletter, your VIP pass to all things exciting and informative. Join our community of growth-minded souls. Get the hottest topics delivered right to your inbox. It's quick, easy, and totally free. Just head over to our website at goboldlyinitiative.com and sign up for our newsletter today. Don't miss out on the next big thing. Stay connected with us. Subscribe now and get ready for some big, bold love. Okay, so welcome back to the show. Before the break, I mentioned I want to continue this conversation around sort of built up physical um, responses, right? The way in which the body holds the energy, holds the um, experience. And what is it like if you're Joe in the street and you like all you think is you have shoulder pain, what is it that you should start? Like what flags are you starting to look for that might tell you, um, you know, that that this is like a buildup of stuff that you need to kind of come in and have a, at least have a conversation around. Sure. Um, the, the main flags would be, um, a progressive worsening of symptoms. So say, you know, somebody's like, Oh, my back usually goes out once a year, once a year, my back goes out, I'm all laid up for two days and then I'm fine the rest of the time. And then you notice that like, Hmm, now it's happening once every six months. And I'm laid up for a week, but eh, you know, I can get through it. And then it's like, Hey, this happened last month and now it's happening this month. And that like, a, you know, a gradual worsening of symptoms. Um, that's a really good indication. Um, also a, a chronic development of symptoms. So like I'm constantly getting strep throat. Why, you know, I'm, I'm constantly getting a reinfection of strep throat or UTIs all the time, but there's no reason why I'm getting UTIs or why I'm getting migraines all the time. Um, those are, you know, the increase of symptoms and an increase in frequency. Um, those are the two biggest red flags. Um, sometimes just things coming out of the blue, not, you know, just, completely random, not related to a specific trauma or a car accident or something like that. Um, something kind of hitting you out of the blue. That's another, another red flag because it's usually the body's way or, you know, pain in these sort of symptoms is the body's way of saying, Hey, pay attention over here. You know, this is important. Um, you know, I'm not able to function like I was, I, I can't handle this anymore. I need help. Yeah. I think culturally, um, we so often go to a doctor, just, a, you know, a regular doctor. And we, we were just talking about this as well. You go to a regular doctor and they treat the symptoms and send you on your way. And maybe it gets a little bit better, but then it comes back and then it keeps coming back and you go and they're like, it's all in your head. Or they go, you go and they say, well, there's nothing else we can do for you. These we're treating the symptoms. This is what it is. And um, so I think what you're talking about is sort of going beyond the symptom underneath to the I, not to get too wooey, but the energy behind the symptom, right? Like the, what is going on in the systemically in the body that is impacting, you know, and coming out as whatever symptom. And, um, I think people and, and Tova, I'm sure you have a question. I, I do want us to get to talking about like, what are some of the challengers to like, to what you do? Are there 
what are the things you've heard people say or the stuff that maybe I don't want to call it mainstream because I don't think it's even mainstream anymore, but like, what do people say about thing, energy healing or cranial sacral therapy or, or these kinds of modalities that are common misconceptions? Like, what do you, what do you hear out there? Um, you know, most of the people who come into my office have some, somewhat of a buy-in, um, in terms of, you know, interest in this therapy or interest in experiencing something that's a little bit more, um, it's based in, like I said, anatomy and, and physiology. Um, but you know, it has an energetic component to it as well, an emotional component to it as well. Um, I think, I think some of the biggest challenges for my clients is having, is be beginning to have some of that awareness of how their mindset and their belief systems are impacting the health and function of their bodies and how open they are to exploring that is usually pretty directly correlates to how well they can heal from something. I mean, you know, there's never, there's never not an emotional component, whether that emotional component is critical to the heal healing of their body or not is, is another thing. You know, I've had people who come in, they've got some tight shoulders. We release some stuff, we release, you know, some structures and get their craniosacral rhythm in line and they're good and they're on their way. Um, and then there are people who we do that same, you know, thing with, and it's just like, it's not getting there. And then we have to go a little deeper and we have to explore some of the emotional aspects and the emotional components. Um, and then we kind of get to like, oh yeah, I carry the weight of the world on my shoulders and I feel responsible for everyone, everyone around me. And I'm always the one taking care of everything. And I, I carry that burden and just making this up, like, you know, giving an example, but, um, but yeah, something like that, uh, it, um, it really, uh, it can really make a, a big difference in the long-term like outcomes of, you know, of their, of their treatment. Um, you know, it, it's interesting just before you had said, um, you know, the, the energy of things, I always kind of, when I'm educating my clients about what this therapy is, I, I, I am going back to like words and how you use words. Like when people say, well, I got choked up, like we're watching a TV commercial or Hallmark commercial. And it's like, oh, yeah, I got yeah. choked up. You know, when they say I got choked up, they mean, you know, I got emotional about something. Well, why do we say I got choked up? Because when you get emotional, whether it's even if it's sad or happy or, or whatever, you physically feel a tightening in your throat and in your chest. And so, so that emotion that you're feeling has a physiological reaction in your body. Um, and that can happen anywhere in your body. And that can happen with, with anything. So, you know, there is, yes, it, it's energy. Yes. It's a little bit more, um, outside the sort of Western medical model, but there's real, you know, basis of physiology in the body that when our body responds to emotions. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Well, and, and I didn't have a question as much as a, a comment back to what you were talking about with kids and how, you know, you were talking about how kids tend to, uh, respond, um, quicker to some of the things that you're working on, but they're also quicker to tell you, like, I don't want you touching me there, or this is where I want you touching me which, and I would imagine adults are much more like, I'm fine. That's <laughs> fine. It's fine. And, and maybe some of it is because, you know, not really our fault in the sense that as adults, we're just more used to um, not even acquiescing, but we're just not as in touch with our bodies. Like we're just, we've have a long, larger, you know, disconnect or even like, uh, you know, this summer we, we were in a water that had, um, sea lice, which isn't lice, but, and my kids were so physically uncomfortable, like they, and my one got a rash. It was a whole thing, but like all three of my kids were like, this is like, they were so in pain. And I mean, I was like, yeah, it's a little uncomfortable, but like the level of pain that I have been in my life compared to them, that is so much higher. Um, and so their discomfort 
and my discomfort, like even if our discomforts were the same, they just have, fortunately have not been into the same physical pain that I have been in. And so they were like, this is the worst thing we've ever felt in our lives. And I'm like, okay, like, yeah, it's a little <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, and, and, you know, so kids, I think, yes, they have that more closer connection to their discomfort, but they're also willing to tell you. And as adults, we're so much more willing to be like, I'm fine. You know, it's fine. And we aren't willing to like, I'm, I'm here. I've taken the time out of my schedule. I'm, I'm paying you or my insurance is paying you. And I'm still not going to tell you that like, I don't want you touching me there, or I do want you touching me here. And, um, and, and, or we're, we're not willing to take the time to take, make the connection between like, Hey, every time I see this person or I have this experience, my bad shoulder flares up or my, you know, and so my, so once again, I don't know that I have a question as much as pointing out to all of us that, um, it is okay to like, not be fine. And to tell somebody like, Hey, I, you know, I'm, that doesn't work for me, especially when we're seeking help. And I think we're so used to going to medical professionals who um, either don't listen, or even if they are listening, there's only one route that they can use to fix a problem that when we are with somebody who has kind of a a wide variety of ways to try to treat something. We need, we need to also open ourselves up to, to help hopefully, um, allow ourselves to be helped. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I work with clients, you know, I try and create a very like calm, relaxed, safe space, but I mean, you know, with, with children, whether that's playing on the floor with their favorite toy, or if it's an adult relaxing on the table, the lights are low, you know, really trying to, to just have that space. But I, I tell people, you know, you can, you can lay down and fall asleep. You can, or you can talk to me the entire time and, or you can do a combination of, of any of it. It's really their experience and what they, you know, I, I'm always trying to get them to connect back to what they want and, and, and connect into that intuition and, and what they need you know, and I'll say, if you want to share with me what you're experiencing while we're having, while we're having treatment, that'd be great. Um, I don't need it, but if that's what would be helpful to you, you know, we can, we can have that dialogue. Um, and I think that often gives them a feeling of like, oh, okay. All right. I can, you know, she's listening and I can, you know, make this what I need to. Some people don't need that. They just come in, they say, all right, I'm going to sleep and they, you know, <laughs> check out and they wake up and they're like, all right, that was great. And I feel, I feel good. And then they're on their way. Um, I have, I have, I runs the, runs the gamut. So, um, I would give a lot to be able to just do that. That is so outside my wheelhouse. I can't just walk into somebody's room and be like, okay, I'm going to go to sleep while you do whatever. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. And and wonderful for those people. Uh, we do need to kind of wrap it up, but I want, I, I just would love to hear before we do that, if you have, um, advice or direction maybe for somebody who's kind of thinking about reaching out to, um, to somebody who does cranial sacral therapy or, you know, even any other kind of, I, I hate saying that I keep saying it non-mainstream, whatever. I think it's mainstream, um, any other kind of modality that, um, but they're not sure, right? Like that maybe they're like, I don't know. What if it doesn't work? What if people are like, what are you doing? Um, you know, what kind of advice would you give to those folks or like where, what direction would you give them? Um, well, first I would make sure that, you know, they, when they're looking for, um, you know, a therapist, whether it's in craniosacral therapy or some other type of modality, um, always look at the person's training, um, what training they've received, um, because it can be wide and, you know, sort of varied, um, looking of course at reviews online. Um, that's, that's very important. I think it's very important for the person to define, um, what their goals are, what do they want to get out of this therapy? 
and how much do they believe that this therapy can help. I think it's also important for them to give it enough time to try it, but also if it's not working, recognize that it might not be for them right now and move on. You know, I have some people who come in because they're interested in craniosacral therapy, but they just want to try it for one session. And I'm absolutely open to doing that, but I explained to them that like, this is a course of therapeutic treatment. So one session, it's not, I don't know how much it's really going to, it's not like, boom, you're healed. <laughs> like that's not going to happen. Which would be awesome, by the way. Yeah, it would be like, amazing. Wow. Right? It'd, be, it'd be awesome. <laughs> um, at the same time, I'm not going to drag it out if, you know, week in and week out, you're coming and you're like, oh, it's really not much change. Maybe that's not for you right now. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that there's no modalities that are are for you. Um, you know, when I have clients there, they might also be getting chiropractic. They might also be getting acupuncture or working with a nutritionist, um, working with a therapist or a mental health coach. I actually like when my clients are receiving other modalities at the same time, not too many. Sometimes people are like, <laughs> I'm doing this, this, and this, and this, and that can be almost less helpful than doing yeah. nothing. Yep. Um, it needs to be balanced, but, um, you know, they need to have, they can be curious. They can be, um, you know, interested in it. They have to have, you know, some investment in it for, for it to work. Um, they have to have some belief and then we can, you know, we can grow it from there. I often ask my clients, another important question I ask my clients is how much do you believe that you can heal from this because I want to meet them where they are. Cause I know personally for me, I believe that someone can heal completely from something, but if they don't believe that, if they think, well, I can just get this down to a manageable level and that's what they want. And that's where their goal is. That's great. Now I know that. And that's what we're going to work with. Cause that's probably what's going to happen. So having that understanding in themselves of what they believe their ability to heal is prior to that is actually very helpful for the treatment and something, you know, so it also matters in terms of like trying something, how much is this bothering you in your everyday life? How much is, are the migraines affecting you? I don't know why I keep talking about migraines. <laughs> it's like stuck <laughs> in my head. Um, but you know, how much is it impacting your ability to function in your everyday life? You know, if it's a minor inconvenience, well, maybe that's not something you need to to address right now. But if it's something that's really, I can't go to work, I can't take care of my kids, I can't do this, I, all of a sudden, you know, it's really impacting your ability to function, then you do need to seek treatment. You do need to go deeper and really try and and uh, and really try and find that healing you're looking for. Um. I keep talking no. over you. So I am no, no, to, no, go I'm ahead. Trying to wait go for ahead. You. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, we do. We've been we've been talking for a while, so we don't want to keep you too long. Um, so we're going to wrap it up. But we have six kind of fun, quick response questions for you. So people can get to know the other side of you a little bit like the just everyday person. Um, so uh, the way it works is I ask the question. You give a response that's, you know, short-ish, and I don't get to follow up, which is my least favorite part of this game that we play, because um, I always have follow-up questions. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. So first question, what is your favorite way to unwind after a long day? What is my favorite way to unwind <laughs> after a long day? Um sitting on the couch and watching TV. <laughs> That's yeah. the real answer. Sounds good. Be real. <laughs> Second question. What is one thing on your bucket list that you haven't done yet? Oh, um, do craniosacral therapy with dolphins down in the Bahamas. Oh my God. I have so many called bio. It's called bio, uh, bio aquatics. I think there's like four or five courses through Upledger that you can, you work with dolphins. They do the, they, they do healing work while you do craniosacral therapy. And I want to do it so bad. And I've been saving up for it. That's on my bucket list. It's amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> number three, what's your go-to comfort food? 
Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> can that be an answer? <laughs> yes. Yes, it can. Ma- uh, marshmallows. Ooh, all right. Number four, if you could instantly master any skill, what would it be? Tai Chi is what popped up into my head. Hmm, I like it. Yeah. Um, this might be duplicative, but number five, what's a hobby that you have always wanted to pick up, but haven't? Oh, um, I would love, I was telling somebody about this yesterday. I would love, uh, to be able to crochet. Crocheting is magic. I don't, I don't believe that it works. I just, um, I just learned how to do rainbow loom. I don't know. I know it's like, oh yeah, we do that. We do that. Oh my God. I'm, a, I'm obsessed. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Number six. Oh, describe yourself in three words. Joy filled, peaceful and grateful. I love it. Um, Thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. We, uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. I have so many more questions about cranial sacral therapy. We might have to do part two at some point. Um, before we let you, uh, off the, off the show, um, where can people find you if they want to learn more about what you do specifically, if they want to come work with you, all the things, where can, where can folks find you? Sure. Absolutely. Um, they can find information about my practice at findrelieftherapy.com. And that has everything that you need to know. Um, you can even book uh, a first appointment right on the website. Um, and uh, they can also reach me by, you know, email, call. Fantastic. Call. All right. Well, we will be sure to put that in our show notes for you all so you can see it and find Amanda. Um, it, she's here in New Jersey, but I'm sure you can, you know, reach out to her from anywhere. Um, and once again, we just, we loved having you on the show. We appreciate your time and energy and everything you do. I think it's wonderful. Tova, I don't know if you have anything else. No, um, just, you know, thank you. And now I feel like I'm excited to make an appointment. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> that's been a while. Yeah. Anytime. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It was great. I could talk about this, this topic and this stuff all day long. So yeah, for sure. Um, all right, everybody, we will be back next week with another episode from season 11. So until then, um, stay well, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to We Go Boldly podcast. We know you're busy and we love spending time with you. If you enjoyed this week's episode, let us know. Head to Apple Podcasts right now to rate and review our show. While you're there, be sure to click that subscribe button. Want more us time? Follow us on all the socials at Go Boldly Together. Want even more us time? As in all the coaching pizzazz. Find us at GoBoldlyInitiative.com for all the info. We will be back with more excitement, research, and deep thoughts next week. Until then, keep on being the bold, brave, amazing people we know you already are. Moms Network, empowering moms to lift the world.